So as we begin this morning, let's go ahead, as we often do, and uh, read our statement of faith. Uh, this is the Apostles' Creed. Read it with me if you would. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, today we are continuing our series called Life According to Jesus. And in this series, we've been taking a look at what Jesus says about living life uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. We find the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapters uh, 5 through chapter 7. And so we're continuing today, and uh, we're picking up in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be starting at verse 16. Jesus is speaking here. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 16, he said, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is talking about two things. Um, there's the obvious topic of fasting, okay, uh, which we'll be talking about, but I think there's also a deeper issue that's going on here as well that we'll be talking about in a little bit, but we're going to start off with the topic of fasting. The first obvious question, what is fasting? I think most of us probably have a pretty good idea of what it is. I mean, a lot of us have had medical tests or procedures where the doctor or the nurse may tell you, now you need to be fasting before you take this test. Okay. And so fasting, uh, we typically associate with, uh, with refraining from eating food for a specific period of time. Uh, but fasting really could include more than that. It's just, it's refraining, uh, from any kind of activity. It's a willful refraining of any kind of activity for a specific period of time. Typically, this is done for spiritual reasons. Now, yes, there's medical reasons to fast as well, but, but a lot of people will fast for spiritual reasons. Of course, in Christianity, fasting is, is one of our spiritual disciplines. Uh, but if you look at many other faiths, there are lots of other faiths where they practice fasting as well. Now, in many of these faiths, fasting is seen as a way to get the attention of their God. Kind of a, look at how much I'm suffering for you, pay attention to me kind of a thing, okay? Um, and in Christianity, though, it doesn't work like that. I mean, quite frankly, um, you can't get any more of God's attention than what you already have. You have God's full attention, okay? Um, and so, you know, we don't need to get God's attention. In Christianity, the purpose of fasting is focus. It's to focus, we ignore our own wants and desires, and we spend the time that we normally would on those wants and desires in focusing on God and our relationship with him. And again, typically, spiritual fasting involves refraining from eating food for a specific period of time. And sometimes it could be a few hours. You know, some people might fast a single meal. Um, some people might go for a day. Some people may go for multiple days. Uh, I've known uh, you know, a few people that have done a 40-day fast like Jesus did, you know, 40 days with no food, okay? I've never done one of those, and I'm okay with that, um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's a long time. But, you know, sometimes this depends on, uh, on how long you go will depend on your physical health. You know, for example, if you are diabetic, it's probably not a real good idea for you to go for a day or more without food. You know, that might be, a, well, I'm going to fast a meal or something like that, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, we think of fasting as refraining from food. But in addition to refraining from food, you can also refrain from other things. 
Now, sometimes people will refrain from just certain types of food. We see this a lot during the season of Lent. A lot of times you'll hear about people giving something up for Lent. And sometimes it's a, it's a specific type of food. Like I've known people that have given up coffee for Lent or chocolate for Lent or just something that they love, you know, ice cream or popcorn or something that they eat a lot that they really enjoy. They'll give that up for a specific period of time. And again, they take the time that they would normally spend on that eating that food and they'll use that to focus on the Lord. There's also... Um, different uh, types of fasting where you refrain from only a specific type of food. And uh, we get an example of this in the book of Daniel, of, of something called a Daniel fast. And uh, we read uh, about the prophet Daniel uh, fasting here in Daniel chapter 10, starting at verse 2, it says this. It says, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So basically during this fast, Daniel wasn't eating any meat, wasn't eating anything sweet, so nothing sweet at all, and nothing savory, meaning nothing that was like really, really good, like bacon, you know? It's like, oh, it's just so good. I don't know why it's so good. Of course, Daniel was Jewish, and so he didn't eat bacon anyway, but, you know, uh, but, you know anything that's like really good. Uh, basically, what Daniel did was he ate vegetables. That's pretty much it. It's vegetables. Um, and it says that he let no wine touch his lips. Now, in Daniel's time, if you wanted to get a drink of something, you basically had two options. You had water or you had, they call it the fruit of the vine, which could be like regular fruit juice or it could be fermented wine. Okay. They're both called basically the same thing. And so basically Daniel was saying he wasn't eating anything but vegetables, wasn't drinking anything but water. And he did it for a period of 21 days. Uh, and the 21 days excluded the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, he was allowed to eat whatever he wanted. Um, and, and so, you know, this is a type of fast that some people have chosen to do. Um, you know, as a church, we've done a Daniel fast a couple of times over the years where we just took a period of 21 days and just really restricted our diet to, uh, to just the basics here. Another type of fasting would be giving up a specific activity. Like I know people that for a period of time gave up television or video games or social media or, you know, whatever it might be, just something that you really enjoy doing and for a period of time, you give that up and then spend the time you would normally spend on that activity in, in prayer and, um, you know, building your relationship with God. Now, here's the key with fasting. Fasting has to cost you something for it to be fasting. Spiritual fasting. For a spiritual fast, it must cost you something. For example... If I stood up and said, I am going to be fasting liver and onions for the next three weeks, that would not be a sacrifice for me at all because I don't like liver and onions. I just don't like it. Just, ah. And I've had some people say, well, if, if you had it the way I cook it, you'd like it. No, I probably won't. I mean, I'll try it. I'll try most anything, but I probably won't. I just, I've tried it lots of different ways. Just don't like it. It would be no sacrifice for me at all to give up liver because I don't eat it. Coffee and chocolate, on the other hand, <laughs> that'd be a real sacrifice. I mean, kind of approaching cruel and unusual punishment, if you know what I mean, <laughs> okay? That would be a sacrifice because I drink coffee every day and I pretty much eat chocolate every day, okay? They're part of my uh, well-balanced diet, okay? Cup of coffee in one hand and a Hershey bar in the other. You know, we got a well-balanced diet right there. Good stuff. But a fast needs to cost you something for it to be considered a spiritual fast. So that's what fasting is. And these types of fasting are mentioned over 70 times in the pages of Scripture. And we read about several people fasting, like we read about Moses fasting. Of course, you know, Elijah fasted. Uh, we read about Daniel fasting. You go into the New Testament, Jesus fasted. Okay, so we have all these, you know, big, big name spiritual people, including Jesus himself, who fasted. So this is something that I think we, as followers of Christ, really need to reinstitute. For the most part, we don't fast, by and large. Like, yes, some people do. Some people have. 
but it's not a regular spiritual discipline. I can honestly say it's been a long time since I've fasted. It's been a few years uh, for spiritual reasons. I mean, I've had, you know, the doctor said, you know, you got a blood test tomorrow, please fast, okay? Uh, but I mean, for spiritual reasons, it's been a few years. I've fasted multiple times throughout the years, but it's been a while. It's a discipline I think that we need to, need to bring back. So that's what fasting is. But what I want to talk about next is what this passage of Scripture meant to the original hearers. The people that originally heard Jesus, what did this passage mean to them? And I think this is an important thing to discuss. Now, why do I say that? Because if you think about it for a moment, Jesus was speaking to a very specific group of people in a very specific culture at a very specific time. It was an ancient, Near Eastern, tribal-based culture, which is incredibly different than our modern Western individualistic culture. If I go to the Bible and I read it with my 21st century Western, fiercely individualistic eyes, I'm going to miss a lot of what's being said. A lot of subtleties that would have made perfect sense to the people in that culture, but don't really relate well to us in ours today. And so I want to take a look at what this would have meant to the people listening to Jesus. And I find it interesting that when Jesus begins this passage of Scripture, it starts off with the phrase, when you fast. Not if you fast, but when you fast. Jesus was assuming that the people listening to him were people who fasted, which was a very good assumption, okay? Uh, in Jesus' day, Pharisees and other religious leaders would regularly fast twice a week. So two days a week, Pharisees and some other religious leaders would regularly fast. And because you know, they as the leaders would regularly fast, a lot of normal people would fast regularly as well. So fasting was something that was, that was done. It was not a commandment from Scripture, but it was an important tradition that they had and a tradition that they allowed to become almost like a commandment from Scripture. Like, you know, if you were serious about God, you fasted twice a week, it's just what you did. And something to note about fasting in that culture, the Jewish day went from sundown to sundown. It wasn't a normal 24-hour cycle that we have that goes from midnight to midnight, okay? Um, in in Jesus' day, you know, like for example, like today, it's Sunday. Uh, when sundown happens tonight, that would be the end of Sunday and the beginning of Monday. And Monday would go through sundown tonight, through sundown tomorrow, then it's Tuesday. Well, you know, for us, Monday doesn't begin until midnight, and it goes through midnight tomorrow. And so what a lot of uh, people who fasted would do is they would eat a nice, you know, beefy filling meal right before the sundown, fast until sundown the next night, and then as soon as sundown was over, eat a nice beefy meal after that. So anyway, Jesus was giving some instruction surrounding this spiritual discipline of fasting. Let's go ahead and read what Jesus has to say here. Jesus says, when you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what Jesus is saying is that Hypocrites fast in a way that draws attention to themselves. It says they would, they would get these looks on their faces that, that would make them look, you know, like they were suffering or like they were hungry. You know, they would, they would dress in such a way to draw attention to themselves. You know, they might even be walking around, you know, just talking about how hungry they are. Oh, I'm so hungry because I'm fasting today. Or maybe they'll see a friend of theirs who's not fasting, enjoying a, a, a nice uh, you know, sandwich or whatever they ate back then, and they'd be looking at that going, oh, that looks so good. I'd love one of those, but I can't because I'm fasting. You know, just drawing this attention, trying to say, look at how spiritual I am. Look how close to God I am because I'm fasting. 
And Jesus said, you know, they've already received their reward in full. He said, they have received their reward in full. Now, what does he mean by that? Jesus is saying the only reward they're going to get is the attention that they're getting from other people. Spiritually, it's not going to do them any good at all. God's not going to honor that fast because they're not doing it with the right motives. They're doing it to draw attention to themselves. The only reward that they get is the attention that they're getting from people. Then Jesus goes on to say what the proper way to fast is. He's like, all right, you know, put oil on your head and wash your face. Basically, to us in our, our modern day, it'd be like, all right, comb your hair, take a shower, wear your normal clothes, don't do anything that would let anybody else know that you are fasting. It's something that's personal. It's just between you and God. Now, occasionally, there are people in our lives that we do need to inform that we are fasting. You know, for example, my wife is the primary cook in our family. She's the one that makes almost all the meals. Well, if I feel God is calling me to a fast, I probably should let my wife know, hey, I'm going to be fasting for however long I feel God is wanting me to fast. That way she knows, okay, now's the time to make liver and onions because <laughs> Harry's not eating because she likes it. All right. I don't like it. She likes it. Or you're like, all right, I'm not, I don't have to prepare for Harry. All right. So it gives her that idea. Or, you know, if, uh, if we have some of the kids home and the kids are sitting down to, hey, where's dad? Well, you know, dad's fasting right now. You know, not in a way of, oh, look at dad. It's just answering their question because they're going to wonder, dad never misses a meal. Where is he? <laughs> you know? Um, so, I mean, sometimes there are people that you need to inform out of courtesy. But it's not like I'm going to get a t-shirt that, you know, big bright neon letter says I'm fasting today. No, I'm not going to post it on my social media. I'm not going to do that. It's something that's between me and God. And Jesus says, when it's secret like that, God, the father who sees what you're doing in secret will reward you. You will get the spiritual benefit of fasting if you do it that way. You see, because God knows our heart's and our motives. God knows whether we're fasting just to get attention or if we're fasting because we want to deepen our relationship with him. Now, sometimes we do things just to get attention, don't we? Well, not everybody. Some people like don't like any attention at all. You know, severe social anxiety. <laughs> That's not me. Uh, I love attention. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yet getting attention for doing spiritual things, it's not the way to go. In fact, there's an interesting passage in, in Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah is writing uh, during the exile. And, uh, and he had this to say in Zechariah chapter 7. This is, this is pretty interesting here. So God spoke to Zechariah chapter 7 verse 4. It says, then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. Ask all the people of the land and the priests when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? Israel was in captivity for 70 years. And in the fifth month and in the seventh month, the nation of Israel would fast while they were in captivity. But God's calling them out. He's saying, was it really for me that you fasted? And that's a rhetorical question because obviously, no, it was not for that. They did it for the wrong reasons. Right thing, wrong reasons, wrong motives. And if you do the right thing with the wrong motives, it's not going to benefit you. You might be impressing other people, but you're not impressing God. Now we come to the deeper issue that I believe Jesus is getting at here. And the deeper issue is this. Whatever we are doing, whether it be fasting or some other spiritual activity, whatever we're doing, God knows our hearts and our motives. God knows whether we're doing it for the right reasons or whether we're doing it just to get attention. You know, and there are people today that love doing things just to get attention. 
And sometimes I'm one of those people. I'll be straight up. Now, typically, I don't do that with spiritual things. I try to be as honest as I can when it comes to spiritual matters, but certainly there are other things I do just for attention. Yeah, I mean, I love attention. <laughs> you know, absolutely love attention. Uh, so, yeah, my wife can tell you over the years, I've done some pretty dumb things just to get attention. Aren't you glad that you guys have never done anything dumb just to get attention? A couple of the boys here today jumped in a swimming pool yesterday. The water was like 62 degrees. Ugh. I mean, they're smart boys, but, uh, you know, I qu kind of question their intelligence after doing that. You know what I mean? In that area, other areas, it's obvious that, you're, you know, you're highly intelligent, of course, but, uh, you know, but uh, anyway, see, <laughs> yeah, he said, <laughs> I'm smart. <laughs> But, I mean, I would do crazy things like that for attention. And sometimes, you know, you do things like that for, for attention with spiritual things as well. And I might fool people for a little while. No, because really, you can fool anybody for a little while. But it doesn't take long before your true colors really show. It's pretty easy to follow all the rules and expectations without it making any difference in our life. You know, and in Christianity, of course, we have our rules. Some are from the Bible, a lot are not. We have our expectations. Some are good, a lot are not. And we follow them because it's what's expected. For example, among evangelical Christians, there are certain political positions and social positions that you are expected to have to be considered a Christian. Now, and again, there are some political and social positions that you shouldn't have as a Christian. Like, you know, if you think that genocide is okay and that racism is okay and that homophobia is okay and that misogyny is okay, then we really need to sit down and have a discussion, okay? Because that's not okay. But there's lots of other things that I don't think really matter, really, but we're expected to believe a certain way to be a Christian. So we act that way because it's what's expected. Maybe not because it's what we really feel and believe in our heart. And if you've been hanging around Harvest for any length of time, you've probably heard me say something along these lines, but I'm going to say it again because this is something I think is so important that we need constant reminders. Now, and I'm going to ask everybody to pay close attention to what I'm about to say because it would be really easy to misunderstand. Okay, so stay with me here before you call me a heretic. All right? And the comment is this, I don't think God is as concerned about our actions as we may feel. I think God is way more concerned about our heart and our motives than he is our actions. And what do I mean by that? There's a big difference between rules and relationships. And I've talked about this before, and, and the best example I can think of is I use the example of my wife and I. You know, my wife and I have been married for 30 years. It'll be 31 years, July 1st. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've had a relationship for a long time, five years of dating, so we've been together 36 years total. Um, and we have a really good relationship. And that relationship has some rules in it. And like most couples involved in a romantic relationship, most couples would agree with me on this, one of the rules is don't cheat. You all would agree that's a rule that you would expect if you're involved in a serious relationship or a marriage with somebody else. You know, that's understood between my wife and I. Yet, if I go to leave the house this afternoon, is my wife going to look at me and say, now, don't you be cheating on me today? Is she going to say that? No. Why? Because I'm not going to cheat. Why? Because I value my life. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, I do value my life. Uh, but uh, the reality is I'm not going to cheat on my wife because it would be breaking the rules, I'm not going to cheat on my wife because I love her. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm going to be downtown and see this really attractive woman walk by and I go, oh, 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 no, 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 I can't. I'm married and I'd be breaking one of the rules. Oh, I'd really like to. I really want to, but no, I can't because I'm married and that's breaking the rules and you're not supposed to break the rules. What kind of attitude is that? It's a bad one. How would my wife feel if she knew that that's how I felt? That, wow, I'd really like to go be with her, but nah, I'm married to you, so I can't. How good would our relationship be if that was my attitude? 
It wouldn't be a relationship. Wouldn't be one. Versus looking at somebody that's very attractive and saying, wow, God, you did a great work there, but leave it at that. I love my wife, so I'm not going to cheat on her because I love her. I mean, you don't even have to give it a second thought most of the time. You know, there are things that I will not say to my wife simply because I love her. I might say it to other people (laughs) in a bad moment in my life, (laughs) but I would never say that to her. Why? Because I love her. So even though that's part of the rules, per se, the rules take care of themselves because of the relationship that we have. And I'll say the same thing with God. If you have the right relationship with God, the rules will take care of themselves. If your relationship with God is right, the rules are going to come naturally, and you're going to want to do them. You're going to want to pray. Why? Because I have a relationship with God, and I love him. I'm going to want to help other people. Why? Because I have a relationship with God and I love him. You know, I'm going to want to, you know, lay hands on this person and pray for him. Why? Because I have a relationship with God and I want to. You know, these are the things that naturally fall into place when the relationship is right. So, you know, yes, rules are important. Life without rules would be hell. Okay, social anarchy does not work. Okay, we need rules but we can't focus so much on the rules. And I'm going to go so far as to say, I could follow all the rules with my relationship with my wife, but have a lousy relationship. Yet, maybe I mess up. Because honestly, given the right set of circumstances, anybody's capable of anything. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. Maybe I make a mistake and break one of the rules and I hurt her deeply. Or maybe she makes a mistake, breaks one of the rules and hurts me deeply. Is our relationship over? No. Is it going to hurt? Sure. Are there going to be consequences? Probably. But because we have a solid relationship, we're going to work through it and it's going to be okay and probably come out stronger in the end. The same thing holds true with God. I've run into so many people who are so nervous, like, oh, am I really saved? And some people that, you know, they say the sinner's prayer like, you know, 50 times a day because they're concerned that, am I really a Christian? I mean, how could God love me because of, you know, I mean, he knew what I did last night and he knew what I did this morning and he knows what I'm thinking about doing tomorrow. And, and I mean, how could he really love me? No, see, if the relationship is there, you don't have those worries so much because the relationship is there. I love God. And yes, I make mistakes. Yes, I mess up. But God knows that my heart, my motives are to follow him and to do things his way. So, back to fasting. Why should we fast? Why should we fast? For focus for focus. In fact, I have a quote here from Bill Johnson that uh, is pretty amazing. Bill Johnson's a pastor in uh, uh, Redding, California, Bethel Church, amazing man of God, one of my spiritual heroes. Bill Johnson had this to say about fasting. He said, fasting is to refine our focus to the kingdom. It's to say no to other appetites so we can totally hunger for the reality of the unseen promises of God to become manifest. Fasting is to refine focus. I love that quote. Fasting is to help us refine our focus on God and the kingdom of God. Should we be fasting as followers of Jesus? Yes, absolutely. We should be fasting. How should we fast? Well, that's between you and God. You know, that's up to you. You know, you and God have a conversation. You do what God says. But I think it's vitally important that we fast. Now, why do I say that? Well, I want to direct our attention to a story that you can find in Mark chapter 9. We're not going to turn there. You can look it up later. 
But in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, we read about uh, the transfiguration. And what happens is Jesus goes up on top of a mountain and he takes three of his disciples with him. He takes Peter, James, and John. And when they get up to the top of the mountain, Jesus is transformed into his heavenly glory. And Peter, James, and John get to see Jesus in his heavenly body. Quite, pretty amazing experience. But while Jesus and the three disciples are up on the mountain, the rest of the disciples are hanging out down at the base of the mountain. So Jesus and three disciples are up on top of the mountain. The rest are hanging out down at the base of the mountain. And while they're hanging out, this dad brings his son, and he's looking for Jesus because he has a son who's demon-possessed, possessed by a demon. And he goes there looking for Jesus, and the disciples are like, yeah, well, Jesus is up on the mountain, but it's okay. We can take care of this. Now, why were the disciples thinking that they could do this? They were thinking they could do this because they'd done it before. We read about how Jesus chose 70 people and sent them out to minister. And while, they were, while he sent them out, he gave them power over demons. He gave them the ability to heal. They had done this before. Every one of them had cast out demons before. Every one of them had laid hands on the sick and, and it had happened before. So they were like, okay, yeah, I know you want Jesus. He's busy right now, but we'll take care of it for you. And so the disciples try to cast the demon out of the boy, and it doesn't happen. Nothing happens. Demon doesn't leave. And we read in, in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark chapter 9, you know, Jesus comes down from the mountain, sees what's going on, goes up and says, you know, hey, what's up? And they, they describe what's going on to him. And, and Jesus, you know, prays for the boy. Demon leaves like that. So later, the disciples go to Jesus, and they're like, hey, how come we couldn't do that? How come you were able to and we couldn't? I mean, we've done it before. How come it didn't work for us this time? And Jesus said, this kind, meaning the kind of demon, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. Now, what did prayer and fasting have to do with this? Again, what's the purpose of fasting? Refine our focus. When we prayer and fasting go together, if you fast, you pray, okay? Spending that time to refocus everything on God. The reason why the disciples couldn't cast the demon out was there was something out of focus in their life. They weren't at that right place with God. They hadn't spent enough time refocusing on God. Now, I don't know what the problem was. Maybe it was pride. I don't know. We could spend all day guessing where their problem was. Scripture doesn't tell us, so we can't know. But we do know that there was something that wasn't right. And I wonder, is this our problem? Because I read in Scripture that the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is in me. The same Holy Spirit that was inside the apostles is inside of us. That Jesus said that we would do the exact same things he did, and he said, you'll even do greater things. He said that signs and wonders should follow those who believe. And you know, and over the years, I've prayed for lots of people. Countless numbers of people I've prayed for. You know, and I have seen some miracles. There have been people I've prayed for that I've seen miracles happen in their life. Sometimes instantly, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but I've seen bona fide miracles happen in people's lives. I've had people pray for me, and I've experienced personal miracles in my own life. You know, personal healing in my own life before. You know, prayer and just instantaneously, it was there. But I'll be straight with you, more often than not, when I pray for people, nothing happens. It doesn't stop me from praying, but I don't normally see the miracle. Yet, when I read the Bible, everybody that Jesus touched was healed. When I read about the apostles, almost every time they prayed for a miracle, a miracle happened. There were a couple times it didn't happen. But almost every time it happened. I personally believe that miracles should be normal in the church. 
that, you know, now we're surprised when a miracle happens. I think it should be the other way around. We should be surprised when it doesn't happen. I want to see miracles, signs, and wonders. Not because I want attention. I mean, yeah, I like attention, but no, that's not why I want it. I want it to build the kingdom of God. There are so many people in our region that are hurting and desperately need a miracle. Maybe they need a physical healing. So many people caught up in addiction. So many people with lousy relationships that need to be healed. So many people struggling with mental health issues. You know, there's just so much going on that we need so many miracles here. Who better to bring the miracles to those people than us? You know, and this isn't just Pastor Harry, Pastor Mike, and the deacons. I mean, we'll, we'll play our part, <laughs> you know. We'll, we'll, we'll pray, but it's you too. It's you too. And I think part of the problem is we don't have that focus on God. So here's your homework. I want you to go home today. Just take, take a little bit of time and ask God, when do you want me to fast? Not if, when. Ask God, how do you want me to fast? What kind of fast do you want me to do? For how long? You know, just ask God and God will reveal to you the right time, the right method. I'm not saying it's going to be easy but it will be worth it. That I promise you. When we get our focus back on God, when we get our relationship right where it needs to be, we'll be amazed at what God will do through us to build his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that you love us. I thank you that you have filled us with your Holy Spirit that the fullness of the deity lives inside of us. And I pray that you would give us wisdom to know how we are to fast, when we are to fast. Just, just let us know. Speak to each and every one of us. Help our focus to be drawn back into you, our relationships to get back to that place that they need to be so that we could make the difference in this world that you've called us to make. In Jesus' name, amen.